2024 is set to be another pivotal chapter in crewed spaceflight. The year kicked off with the launch of the first all-European commercial astronaut mission to the International Space Station. And liftoff. And as early as April, NASA, Boeing and United Launch Alliance are poised to launch the first crewed flight test of the Starliner spacecraft to the ISS. But among those and others is a free-flying mission called Polaris Dawn that will attempt something never done before, a non-governmental spacewalk. It's been an awesome journey and we still got a little ways to go. This is Mission Commander Jared Isaacman. He and Mission Pilot Scott Kid Poteet sat down with Spaceflight now for a conversation on the sidelines of the inaugural Space Force Association's Space Power Conference in Orlando. Many will undoubtedly remember Isaacman from his first space flight, 2021's Inspiration 4. Like Inspiration 4, Polaris Dawn will also focus in part on raising funds for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. But as far as the other objectives, Polaris Dawn ups the ante by quite a bit. This time around, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, kind of our, our, our specific objectives, the altitude, especially the EVA and the new suit development. And kind of unlike being there at the end where they say, you know, here's your suit, um, we get to be there through every iteration of it, you know, starting with an IVA suit that's not really suitable for going outside the vehicle to what we have now, which is getting close to the, to the flight article. Developing a new spacesuit is no simple task. Right now, both Axiom Space and Collins Aerospace are developing their own suits for missions both on the surface of the moon as well as to operate outside the International Space Station. Soon, SpaceX aims to have its own suits as well, but the process is not an easy one for any company. SpaceX's pace of development on building an EVA suit is wicked fast right now. And, uh, you know, you start with an IVA suit that's already certified, of which it has, you know, under pressure, very little mobility. There's no, you know, mechanical joints in it. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, it's a last line of defense. I mean, you're only using that if everything else around you in the spacecraft failed into an environment where you are throwing away all of the safety of your spacecraft and all the redundancies that are built into it, and now all you have is a suit. Isaacman says the Polaris Dawn team and SpaceX are not only working on hardware for the future, but also making sure that the lessons of the past are not forgotten as development continues. You know, the early days of the space program, what the cosmonauts and, you know, Ed White went through and, and other astronauts was like, they, I mean, they're mass fogged over. They could barely get back into the Gemini spacecraft. I mean, there is a lot of lessons that are learned that have to be applied to this suit. Um, and they've done it incredibly fast with a lot of testing and development. Poteet, who was a retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, echoed Isaacsman's assessment of SpaceX's pace of development. He's not only seen it in motion during this Polaris Dawn project, but also during his time as mission director of the Inspiration4 mission. Back in pilot training, we were still using devices and, and procedures that they were using 50, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Here, they're creating these training devices to simulate um, something that's very difficult to simulate, zero gravity, with um, certain uh, harnesses and, uh, you know, these different uh, monster garage type devices to offload uh, some of the challenges associated with, you know, being at 1G trying to simulate this whole EVA. Isaacman said that in addition to developing the suits themselves, SpaceX is also preparing for its Crew Dragon spacecraft to perform entirely new functions to support a spacewalk. There is no airlock, right? So you have to vent the entire vehicle down. So it's not an airlock that has to be qualified to vacuum. It's the entire spaceship that has to be done. You're also going to be using consumables at a substantially higher rate than you would before because you're using oxygen for cooling. Uh, so you need a lot more tanks than a Dragon would typically be equipped for, plus, you know, the, the air to, to, uh, to repressurize it. So a lot goes into that. Isaacman said that as of mid-December, they were getting in fit checks of the final cut of the EVA suits. And while the spacesuit work is being done, Isaacman and his crew have been busy going through a wide variety of training exercises. He says this crew immediately gelled because of their extensive history with one another. Everybody in the, on the Polariston crew you know, contributed extensively to Inspiration4. Um, you know, Sarah Gillis was a lead astronaut trainer for that program. So we got very close over six months. She was the core, so she was the, the first voice we heard when we strapped into, uh, into Dragon and the voice we heard going all the way up to space. So a lot of trust there. 
Anna Menon is a lead mission director at SpaceX. SpaceX. She runs Mission Control. She was assigned to our families to be the one to translate the good and, if necessary, the bad news to them. That's a, that's a position of a lot of trust. And then, obviously, Kid was the, the mission director on it. So I'd say, like, we all started from, like, a pretty awesome place. That said, like, you know, we, we didn't, you know, take that for granted. We still went and tried to, to push the boundaries that are really needed to build a, a strong team. Some of that boundary pushing training included flying jets, going skydiving with the Air Force Academy, scuba diving, and mountain climbing, just to name a few. Poteet says their first big simulation, though, is an experience that really sticks out in his mind. These uh, uh, lead trainers know how to put... Um, challenges to the test. Uh, so we, you know, uh, for lack of better description, we, we failed miserably on that first sim. There was a lot of learning, uh, but it uh, provided a sense of humility uh, how we approach our training going forward from that point. We still have a lot to learn. I definitely have a lot to learn, but um, as we go through these milestones, we hit these uh, significant points in our training. It just continues to build our confidence. The Polaris Dawn team says their goal goes far beyond this singular mission. During a panel discussion at the Space Power Conference, they described the process as a developmental program. As of mid-December, Isaacman said they were about 70% of the way from the starting point of that first development phase about two years ago. This is important. Uh, they envision a future that's more exciting when people can journey among the stars. You need a lot of spacesuits. They shouldn't cost hundreds of millions. They should cost a lot less and be scalable. We'll be testing the first iteration of those suits out. Um, and then our third is we'll communicate over uh, laser links with Starlink, and then we have about 40 science and research experiments over the five days, essentially, that our, our life support systems can sustain the vehicle. Isaacman also laid out the ambitious goals for the next two flights of the Polaris Dawn program after the suits are qualified. So maybe familiar is a study to rendezvous with Hubble, boost it, leave it a little bit healthier, give it a chance to operate alongside James Webb for a couple decades longer, and then maybe we go up and get it in a starship and drop it in the Smithsonian someday. It'd be pretty cool. So that's in NASA's hands to decide if they want us to touch their telescope. I'd say the risk-reward is pretty favorable for it, not to mention builds awesome capabilities for commercial space that's going to be required for our future. And then the third mission will be the first group flight of Starship. Um, we got some time on that, but, uh, but that's pretty exciting. As everyone knows, that'll be, the, that'll be the game changer, right? And in early 2024, the team is still working towards the hope of launching this year, understanding that the readiness of the spacesuit is the long pole in the tent. But as they really get into the end game of the training, they're not looking past what they've already accomplished so far. And I absolutely love every moment that we're training. Um, you know, we get closer and closer to launch, uh, so we achieve these milestones, and it's, um, it's kind of like these holy shit moments uh, when we're in the capsule, and, and we're just like, Wow, here's the crew, you know, this is where we are in the phase of flight. Uh, and it becomes more and more real uh, as we get closer to the launch itself. Reporting in Orlando for Space Flight Now, I'm O'Robinson Robinson-Smith. Hopefully in April, and, you know, as Kid mentioned, you have to uh, 